Hello, you're watching Eye on Nigeria's Capital Market. I'm Wale Famarewa, and thank you for joining us. Last April, Seplat raised over half a billion dollars in what was the largest initial public offering in the history of Nigeria's capital market. This after almost six years of very little activity in that market segment. So in this program, we examine for you what to expect going forward. The four years from 2004 to 2007 were widely regarded as a boom era in Nigeria's new equity issues market. Robust economic growth and regulatory changes were key factors that led to a flurry of mega share offerings. I've been in this market for a very long time. And the, the peak of the market was in 2007, when the total equities raised was valued at 1.34 trillion, which far exceeded the amount of equities that was raised between 1981 and 2006. And of course, all of this was as a result of the banking consolidation, the, um, the pension industries reforms, the insurance sector's consolidation. All of this created awareness, massive awareness for the capital market. And again, the exit of Nigeria from the Paris Club also contributed various government reforms. The banking sector dominated the market. Most of their offers were in billions, you know, and they were like two, three, four hundred times oversubscribed. There were very few and far between non-bank um, IPOs at the point. And even those that came also raised substantial amounts of money. But came 2009, you would not believe it. Only one company came to the market with only 3.3 billion. It was terrible. And thereafter, from 2010, 2011, 2012, not one, not one single one came for an IPO. Stock prices of industry giants were crashing. Investors were badly burnt and weary. Hardly a thriving scenario for an initial public offering. As a result, the IPO market ground to a halt, and the capitalists behind the wheels looked for funding elsewhere. What we saw was that people were raising more of debt and a lot of availability of bank loans, given the liquidity that we had in the banking system. So the first set of investors that came in on the investments that were raised were through private placements. Because clearly, if you try and do a public offer, people were just not uh, interested. So what we saw initially was private placements. We saw a lot of takeovers. People, uh, private equity funds came into the marketplace and they raised uh, money for those companies that were actually doing well. What we saw were struggling companies who could not raise uh, capital, obviously, through the stock market again. You had people investing in those, in those uh, companies. Uh, after the private placement era, what we now saw was gradually, as those companies gave a couple of returns, the first people that actually saw it were the existing shareholders. So we now saw rights issues uh, come up. Now, with the low valuations immediately following the crisis, many companies were reluctant to sell outside of their own investors, especially where those shareholders demonstrated an interest in supporting the company's growth. Um, there have also been a number of private placements which are generally targeted at pre-identified um, strategic and institutional investors. Um, there are many companies, you know, from our own discussions that have, that continue to consider, you know, the IPO um, as a, the, a public market route, as a viable option for raising capital. Um, and there's been some reluctance with how much can be accessed in the market However, local oil producer Seplat, raising half a billion dollars in fresh capital, signals optimism and renewed vigor. Our focus on market integrity, our focus on restoring investor confidence have been primary drivers of where we are today. Uh, in terms of market integrity, no one uh, will seek uh, to issue in this market or invest in this market if we have not promoted and therefore developed the culture that we have today. Uh, of zero tolerance for anything uh, that is improper. Uh, what we've seen um, as a result of that focus on market integrity, on restoring investor confidence, is a market that has recovered. Uh, one where in 2012, uh, the oil share in, uh, index rose by 35%, uh, and in 2013, uh, rose by 47%. Um, so what we've seen is valuations that are more reflective of where issuers uh, want to see uh, their companies listed uh, and we see investors feeling comfortable that if they invest in companies that those companies 
um, uh, they will get value from investing in those companies. Uh, also important uh, is our focus on advocacy. Uh, I believe that today there's a clearer understanding amongst policymakers about the importance of the capital markets and specifically the importance of companies listing on the Nigerian Stock Exchange. Uh, I also believe that issuers understand the benefits uh, of listing. Uh, I believe investors understand the value uh, that a well-regulated world-class capital market brings to them in terms of enabling them to create wealth. More specifically, uh, some of what we've done in terms of uh, transitioning to reporting under international financial reporting standards, uh, our new code of corporate governance, approving new listing uh, rules, uh, which has led to companies uh, like Seplet, uh, the upstream uh, oil and gas uh, exploration company, uh, listing, dual listing on the Nigerian Stock Exchange and the London Stock Exchange, I think have created that momentum that we're seeing uh, uh, today. And for us, uh, the Sepler dual listing transaction is one that's very, very important because we provided, we gave our own approval way before the UK listing authority did. Uh, but for us, it was very important that this transaction was dual listed because what it basically has told the world is that we have the same requirements as you have in the UK, that we have the same standards and that as an apex regulator that we're keen to make sure that we operate on the world class standards in the Nigerian capital markets. The Seplat IPO is significant for Nigeria's capital market for several reasons. It was the first Nigerian company to get approval from the UKLA to list its primary securities on that market. It was the first company to get approval from two sets of regulators to undertake a global offering from Nigeria at the same time. And I'm talking about a global offering of equivalent securities. We've had GDRs before, but GDRs are wrappers around you know, ordinary shares, whereas the Seplat IPO represents the issuance of ordinary shares in the two markets. Um, unbelievably, it's the first time that a Nigerian company will be dual listed in Lagos and in London. We also hadn't seen that before. Um, it's the first IPO in Nigeria to settle on a T plus three international um, basis. So investors were in their securities three days after they paid. Um, it's the first IPO that we've seen. Um, <clears throat> it's the largest IPO that we've seen in the market since the crash of 2008. It's the largest IPO that there has been in Nigeria to date, $500 million. Um, we haven't seen levels you know, um, similar to that before. It's the first Nigerian E&P IPO um, since the government started the indigenization drive to move oil and gas assets, especially at the upstream end, into Nigerian hands. This is the first um, company to offer a broad base of Nigerian investors the opportunity to participate. The separate growth story and the journey from a fringe oil producer to becoming a reference point for would-be Nigerian IPO issuers was fraught with difficulties. Seplat's chairman, ABC Ojiako. It was basically started by two Nigerian oil and gas companies that were having their own respective operations in the Niger Delta. Platform and Sheba. And shortly after the incorporation of this company, early 2010, we pioneered acquisition of divested asset by Shell, Total, and ENI. And in this process, to be able to raise the financing required, we brought in the French independ independent at the time, establishment Moral and Prom. And at that, we concluded the transaction, signed the SPA 2000. Uh, 10 in January and by July of the same year we got government approval, hit the ground running, became the first company in Nigeria to do this transaction. The first and only company that retained operatorship of the assets we took and from there the, the story started. The, the IPO was a very interesting and challenging uh, exercise for us. It's true that we did it simultaneously. It was two days, L London and, and in Nigeria. But it's actually a three-year exercise. We started in 2011, and it was quite a lot of processes. First of all, we had to prepare ourselves psychologically for it. We had to work internally to ask ourselves very pertinent questions, assess our level of preparedness internally. And when I mean internally, I mean at the board level, then of course took it to the management level 
Uh, and it was not an easy process, I must uh, accept. And what we have seen is that once we made up our minds, we were going to do it, we held our hands, held the plow, we never stopped. After the break, we continue our look into Nigeria's IPO market and Seplat, its most recent success story. Welcome back to Eye on Nigeria's Capital Market. We continue our review of Nigeria's IPO market with a focus on Seplat, a company that recently issued a record-breaking IPO. I sat down with Seplat chairman ABC Ojiako to get his thoughts on what is driving a company now listed on the London Stock Exchange. There were very many reasons why it was particularly challenging at the time. The market was very uh, volatile at the time. There were very many incidences of malpractices in the market. The emerging market challenges were there. We had the issues of Bumi. We had a lot of things that made it even more onerous for a Nigerian company being an emerging market company to have the audacity to want to come to the London Stock Exchange and at the main board uh, for that matter. So the, the regulatory requirements were really tightened. We did not give up. We basically focused on everything they needed us to do. The UKLA was particularly stringent. They made sure that they did not want to take a risk and bring in another uh, company that will bring uh, the, 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 uh, uh, the market institute to distribute. So they subjected us to very high level of scrutiny and we're happy we surmounted all of them. One of the challenges, of course, was the fact that we needed to reconcile the regulatory requirements between the two boards, I mean the two uh, uh, markets. And of course, internally, we knew what we needed to do, and therefore we focused very strongly on corporate governance and best practices. And the very first thing we did was to reorganize and restructure our board. Our board was, from inception, a shareholder board. Basically, the three main shareholders made nominees to the, to the board membership at the time. But of course, the first thing we did was to restructure that and change the board, made it a board that has a lot of independent non-executive directors and empower those independent non-executive directors to really take charge of the board committees. The next thing, of course, we did quickly was to put in place very pertinent corporate governance policies and regulatory framework that will make us very visible and a company that will be reckoned with internationally. A notable element in the Seplant IPO was the use of an offer marketing plan called book building to gauge investors' interest and discover an appropriate price for the shares to be issued. It's the first time since 2007 that this method has been used to sell shares in Nigeria. And while it precludes retail investors from investing in IPOs, the success is evident. Look at it from the point of view of the guy raising the money. They want their money as quick as possible. And the institutions are the ones who can move as quick as possible. I think the, the IPO process where you involve the retail investors is just too is too long, right? And by the time you do the prospectus, you go to the markets, you do the advertising, collect the forms and everything, the book building process is easier. And so from from our point of view, the retail investor is best tapping and using our medium, which is mostly the uh, collective investment schemes, mutual funds, to access this market. Because you will get that as more and more offers come to the market. I think we will always be able to do offerings in Nigeria the way we did them before, where offerings were targeted at a broadly retail market. But if you think of an exploration and production company, in reality it is riskier than your regular you know, manufacturing offering, FMCG offering, um, or financial services offering. It's a business to business. And we felt for Seplat and for several oil and gas companies you know, that they focus, the bulk of the demand will come from institutional investors. If another company comes up, uh, wants to raise money from Lagos, from London, I think it's quite reasonable to assume that that's the route they'll follow a book bill. That's what most investors are used to. Um, on the local side, you know, really, like I said earlier, there really isn't enough evidence to prove that fixed price is better than book bill, for example, or vice versa. I think it all depends on how much visibility there is on the entity in question to start with. 
um, and who the potential investors are. Are they going to be more retail, local investors? Are they going to be more sophisticated, institutional investors offshore? Uh, those are the sort of factors that would, uh, would, would come into play. I think the book build method was a useful way of um, allowing investors to participate in pricing discovery and determining the appropriate price at which the transaction should be done. And it's probably useful that we've seen a positive reaction um, in the aftermarket since the, since the launch of the IPO. But more importantly, um, you know, based on Nigerian regulations, there are only a limited number of people that can participate in a book build. It's open to qualified institutional investors and a handful of um, individual investors. Historically, and if you look at even Nigerian public offers, even way back all the time I've been back in the past couple of decades, most offers have been successful, not because of the full retail, with the exception of the privatization offers. Most uh, private companies or public companies that are raising money outside privatization offers have only been successful not because of the retail. The retail part have been barely 15, 20 percent of the total offer. Because of the knowledge gap by the uh, retailers, we have to be very careful. If you just say that the uh, retail, uh, an offer is for retail investors, how are we sure about the information being passed on to them? How are we sure that they fully understand why they are investing? That's why there's been a deliberate attempt, I see one uh, saying, a deliberate attempt to encourage them to buy into funds that are managed by professional fund managers. And I think that is the way forward. And the fund managers clearly, clearly can decipher which one is a good offer, which one they can participate in, which one is overpriced, which one is underpriced. And I think that uh, price discovery mechanism that is a book building is obviously the way forward. You fill in an application form, you now send the money. For about five, six to eight weeks, the money is sitting in an account doing nothing. Now, if you as an investor have given me the funds to invest on your behalf, I can't come back to you and sort of say a portion of your money, 1%, 2%, or however amount you put in there, is sitting in an account earning zero because we've subscribed to an IPO. Using the book building process, the day we, sub they will, give us, we will subscribe, they'll give us a day of settlement, and the stocks start trading the next day or worst case three or four days later. So yes, it's good for us. Uh, even the retail investor would not want their money tied down. While the book building process was successfully used in the Seplan IPO, investors and fund managers say that regulators can do more to facilitate the revival of the IPO market going forward. Unfortunately, the regulators are saying, oh, come, and when you're coming, you don't need to have a forecast. Uh, and the same market is talking about information for all. If a few persons have direction as to where the company is going to go, that is one major aspect of this, uh, of the, uh, one of the major issues that the regulators need to address. Secondly, you also have a situation where quite often there's usually some disconnect uh, at the point of listing. Uh, for instance, you find instance where on the day of listing, shares are not available. There's always money, there's always things to do, and they follow sort of the path of least resistance, if you look at it that way. So in other words, you know, if we want more deals like this, I think it starts all the way from the regulators. It's pretty simple. Create a very conducive environment, create a market that is transparent, that is visible, that people trust. Um, make sure your fees are not too high, um, you know, and uh, just create a very conducive environment. That's why China, uh, for example, is, uh, is getting a lot of IPOs over the U.S., for example, because of these sorts of reasons. Um, so I'd say cost and um, a conducive sort of well-run uh, uh, market. Even while there's room for improvement, investors and fund managers are now looking beyond the separate IPO transaction. One success should lead to more as companies in Africa's largest economy seek capital to tap more opportunities in Nigeria. Regarding the power companies, the Gencos and the Discos, uh, you would know that given that they were federal government companies at the time, there are a lot of preparations that they need to do before they can be ripe you know, to come to the market as, a, as IPOs or public offers. And therefore, they have taken the, step, the first step. They are currently in the commission you know, uh, preparing to register their existing securities in preparatory. So we are, as we prepare them, we, we hope that in, in the shortest possible time, they will be able to be ready to come to the market. But we have um, a very important uh, company in the agri sector that has already indicated interest to come to the market. We expect that it will come a matter of weeks to be in the commission and um, it will be in the market. 
And of course, there are others that we have also had uh, getting ready to come, given the success of Seplat. I think Seplat uh, has injured a lot of other companies. You know, they, they, they now know that if, if um, a good company comes to the market, investors will be ready you know, to buy them. The pension fund managers sit on a large pool of funds that are available to deploy to the capital market. I'm not so sure the exact percentage, but clearly I don't believe we have up to 15% of uh, the asset under management being invested in the Nigerian stock market. So clearly, with the recovery of the market and with more quality offers coming into the marketplace, I do, I do believe that clearly they will move into the market, especially given the monetary stance that is now leading towards lower inflation, lower interest rate, they will be looking for yield. And clearly the yield will come from the equity market. One area that is quite large that has not been tracked, just now we're getting statistics, is the diaspora inflow into the Nigerian market. Uh, the kind of figures we are hearing about what came into Nigeria, uh, into Nigeria last year from diaspora, uh, from Nigerians in diaspora, is quite significant. We are hearing over ten billion dollars. Now we need to know how much of that is coming to the market. That's also a large pool of funds that is available to be tapped, ready to invest in Nigeria. If you look at the size of deposits in the banking system alone. I mean, we did a survey as of September last year, there was about $20 billion just in domiciliary accounts alone. Now think about how much is going to be in current accounts, in savings accounts, and in fixed deposits. The amounts are there, but also know that investors are discerning. Money always follows where the returns are. Look at the market now. When uh, the Treasury bill market started going south, the equity market started going north. So there is some uh, issue of rotation happening in there. So there are funds out there. Uh, investors also need to be educated about uh, the tenor of investments. If you need short-term money, put it in treasury bills. If you're investing for the medium to long term, yes, you can look at the equity market, but don't expect things to go up and go down. And a successful $500 million raise r r demonstrates that the market exists. And I think it's very significant, you know, we cannot underestimate um, the importance of the fact that more than half of that demand came from Nigerian investors. Um, so for the appropriate company, for the right structure, you know, properly priced, we cannot obviously underestimate the importance of doing your homework and getting it right. The regulators of the market also have their eyes set on the future in a bid to create a truly world-class capital market in Nigeria. The stock market capitalization uh, today of 16% of GDP, we're nowhere where we benchmark ourselves. Uh, when you have South Africa at 230% of GDP or the US at more than 100% of GDP. So there's still a lot of work to do. And for us, that work has to be focused on the large companies that should be listed on the Nigerian Stock Exchange, whether it be in the telecom sector, in oil and explore, uh, exploration, given the momentum that Seplat has created in power, in agriculture, and the key sectors of the Nigerian economy. So our advocacy will, will, will remain targeted at these large companies and these sectors that are particularly important because the Nigerian stock market should reflect the Nigerian economy because the Nigerian stock market is a barometer uh, of the economy. So advocacy is particularly uh, critical for us. In that respect, uh, when we're asked, um, do you support um, companies being compelled to list, we say there's no reason for companies to feel compared to list because the benefits are enormous. So what we've done uh, um, over the years, which we'll continue to do, is to articulate what those benefits are, what it does for your brand, what it does for your reputation, and what it does for the perception of a company, that you're a company that truly wants to abide by the highest levels of corporate governance. Uh, what we're seeing is that policy makers in those particular sectors are very much familiar today with that story and they're working closely with us and encouraging the companies in their particular sectors uh, to list. We also believe that the integration of the West African capital markets is very, very critical. Uh, Nigeria's GDP has been rebased. It's considered uh, the, uh, the largest economy in Africa. Uh, Nigeria has the largest market. Uh, this is the place to list if you want to have that gateway into West Africa. And what I would even say, a gateway, uh, into Africa. So the benefits are enormous. Um, as a capital markets community, 
uh, we're very excited about the work that's being done on the capital market master plans. Uh, and that work will continue to enhance the sophistication of our market, support the development of the breadth and depth of our market, and therefore that also supports the development uh, of an IPO market. Considering the strength of the stock market recovery, a record-setting IPO earlier this year, and the capital requirements of Nigerian companies seeking to exploit the opportunities in Africa's largest economy, all indicators point towards renewed appetite for new equity entrants. Wale Famrewa, CNBC Africa.